Michael Audrey Myers was born in the year 1957 as the second child in his family after his nine-year-old sister, Judith. In this video, I'm only analyzing the original timeline of Michael's life, which includes the events of Halloween, Halloween 2, Return, Revenge, and Curse. The date of Michael's birth in this timeline is not explicitly stated, but in Halloween Resurrection, which is part of a different timeline, we learn this. Michael Myers. Born October 19th, 1957. Both of these timelines start with the same movie, Halloween, which would imply that Michael was also born on October 19th in that movie. I like to think about the Halloween timeline as a train map, which I call the Halloween Express. So think about it like this. If we depart from the station, Halloween 1, at exactly 1019, we can go straight and end up in Curse of Michael Myers, or we can go this way and end up at Halloween Resurrection. No matter which way we went, we still departed from the Halloween 1 station at 1019. The counter argument to that idea is Halloween 2018. In Rick Rosenthal's Halloween 2, we learn Michael Myers and Laurie Strode are siblings, which would mean that they were always siblings, even in Halloween 1. However, in Halloween 2018, they don't appear to be related, because the 40-year timeline does not pass through Halloween 2. However, it's possible that they still are related, just nobody ever finds out. Wasn't it her brother who, like, cold-blooded murdered all those teenagers? No. That's just a bit that some people made up to make him feel better, I think. There are other retcons that don't carry over to other timelines, so all I'll say with certainty is that Michael was born sometime in the year 1957. Yeah, this is gonna be one of those episodes of horror history. Michael was three years old when his sister Lori was born in February 1961. His early childhood is presumably a normal one until two and a half years later when he is cursed by an ancient demon known as Thorn. To learn what really happened to Michael after disappearing from Haddonfield, stick around to the end of this video. Welcome to Horror History, and welcome aboard the Halloween Express. The Halloween timeline can be a little bit confusing at times. We've got many different continuities branching out from the first two movies. Then we've got a reboot, which isn't connected to anything, and Halloween 3, a separate world where the original Halloween is just a movie. On top of that, there are comics and novels whose status in the canon can be kind of unclear. So to make things easy for this episode, we're gonna be traveling right down the original route as we analyze horror's most iconic slasher. Michael Myers was named after a real-life Michael Myers by the original director John Carpenter, who wanted to honor the European distributor of his previous film, Assault on Precinct 13. To understand how Michael became the soulless, immortal killer that he is, we've gotta take it way back to about 500 BCE. The Myers family is descended from an ancient Druid tribe who worshipped great astronomical deities. The Druids were a mysterious Celtic order known for their studies of religious scriptures, philosophy, astronomy, and divine lore. They were said to make sacrifices, which sometimes included human sacrifices for the sick or injured, which allegedly included the burning of huge wickerwork figures filled with men. Not much is known of the Druid culture because they did not keep any records, but around 500 BCE, they did create an ancient alphabet carved into stone and wood ruins. These ruins were used for pagan rituals in order to help the tribe predict future events. One of the icons was the symbol of Thorn, which was designed after the Thorn constellation and was used to represent an ancient demon that plagued the Celtic people. Among the ancient druids, Thorn represented a demon that spread sickness, destroyed crops, brought death to hundreds of thousands of people. According to Celtic legend, one child from each tribe was chosen to be inflicted with the curse of Thorn. While knowledge of the demon Thorn faded into legend over the coming millennia, the bloodline of the tribe stayed intact, and one offshoot of the population ended up in the Midwest region of the United States. They continued to practice their ritualistic sacrifices in fear of the malicious demon, and they called themselves the Cult of Thorn. In the early 1960s, the leader of the cult was a man by the name of Terence Wynn, who worked at the sanitarium known as Smith's Grove by day, and used the facility as a meeting place and worship ground by night. One child, from each tribe was chosen to be inflicted with the curse of Thorn to offer the blood sacrifices of its next of kin on the night of Samhain. Halloween. The sacrifice of one family meant sparing the lives of an entire tribe. So Dr. Wynn believed that if he and his cult placed the curse of Thorn on one child, the child would be compelled to kill his entire family, but the rest of the tribe would be protected from things like disease, death, plague, and drought for an entire generation. I do not know how their selection process went, but Dr. Wynn ends up choosing a six-year-old boy by the name of Michael Audrey Myers. The curse must be placed during the Festival of Samhain. Samhain. Which is a Gaelic festival of pagan origins where the barrier would supposedly be down between the real and the unreal, allowing sacrifices, be those crops, animals, or in the case of the Halloween movies, human sacrifices, to be made. Samhain takes place every year at the end of the harvest season. Today, in the Northern Hemisphere, we call that Halloween night. However, in the eyes of the cult, some Halloween nights were more special than others. The Druids were also great mathematicians and astronomers, but the thorn symbol is actually a constellation of stars that appears from time to time on Halloween night. 
whenever it appears, he appears. I'd like to note that the Druids, the Pagans, the Festival of Samhain, Samhain, and the ritualistic sacrifice of crops and animals during the festival are based on real life, while the Cult of Thorn and the Thorn Constellation are not, but the name Thorn is based off of a letter in the Old English alphabet. It looks kind of like a P and a B put together, so they made the movie version just look a little bit more thorny. The Thorn Constellation in the Halloween movies appears in the sky at seemingly random intervals. They're just the same years that the Halloween movies came out. Its first appearance in Michael's lifetime comes in 1963, and this is the night that Dr. Wynn and his cult place the curse on the young boy, forever changing his behavior and making him an empty soulless killing machine. In my Things You Missed episode on Halloween 1978, I talked about how Michael's actions that night could be interpreted as representing a release of psychosexual trauma that Michael was too young to understand. I went in depth with the psychological interpretation on that video because it doesn't fall in line with the information presented in Halloween 6, The Curse of Michael Myers. So in this video, since we're analyzing his entire character, that psychological interpretation doesn't make sense. Michael is simply possessed by the cult. Michael Myers' power is described by Dr. Wynn as something greater than a man driven to commit crimes. Evil. Pure, uncorrupted, ancient. On October 31st, 1963, Michael's parents go out for the evening, and his older sister is hanging out with her boyfriend, so he's left in the care of an older woman named Mrs. Blankenship across the street. He begins to hear a voice in his head. Presumably, this was the voice of Dr. Wynn, or possibly the demon Thorn itself. Michael heard a voice? It told him to kill his family. And that's exactly what he does. He grabs a knife and goes to take out his sister by stabbing her several times, before his parents eventually come home to discover what he had done. Michael is sentenced to Smith's Grove Sanitarium and assigned to a doctor named Samuel Loomis. In a hearing six months later, in April 1964, Loomis was instructed to report on Michael's progress to the court two times a year. Further. Michael Audrey Myers shall be brought before the court on the day of his 21st birthday, where he shall be tried as an adult. Michael was seemingly in a catatonic state, causing nearly everyone to see him as harmless other than Dr. Loomis. His initial stay at Smith's Grove lasted 15 years, none of which is documented in the Halloween films. However, the non-canon Chaos Comics material tells of Michael's involvement in more murders. These stories occasionally contradict the canon, but they were written to go in tandem with Michael's original story, so no, they don't technically count as part of his history history, but let's go over them briefly. Michael was sent to Rome with a number of male patients, one of which was a psychopath named Tony O'Malley, who got into a scuffle with Michael one night before bed and had to be separated by a security guard. He was put off by Michael's non-speaking nature and plans to attack him in his sleep, but Michael was not asleep and shoved a crayon, or depending on where you're from, a crayon into Tony's left eye. Tony was actually one of the few Michael victims to survive, but the crayon, or crayon, pressed up against his brain, causing him to become more delusional and violent, landing him in a padded cell for solitary confinement. In November 1964, a juvenile named Adrian Wade, who suffered from an obsessive eating disorder, ate a cake that was intended for Michael. So Michael trapped him in the showers and tortured him with scalding hot water. He was found unconscious with multiple burns and later died in the hospital wing of heart failure. Years would go by without incidents, and most of the staff considered Michael a model patient. But then, in 1971, another young patient, a self-harmer named Roger, who claimed to have witnessed Michael's attack on Tony O'Malley, was found after supposedly biting off his own tongue and choking on it. If you're familiar with Michael, you can probably assume that that's not how things really went down. That Halloween, one of the asylum's administrators decided to put on a Halloween party for the kids, and Michael wore a clown costume. The same costume he wore when he jabbed Judith in 1963. A girl named Nancy teased Michael for having cooties. During a game of bobbing for apples, lightning struck the building, causing the power to go out. And in the cover of darkness, Michael drowned her and disappeared before the lights came back up. When Loomis discovers what happened, he's furious, frustrated by his patient's continued silence, and nearly strikes the boy before being stopped by his fiancée, Jennifer. Jennifer mentions that she believes Michael belongs in a prison, which Michael seems to hear, and he decides to make her his next target. He throws her off the roof of the building, and it is ruled that she made the jump by herself. What do all of these Chaos Comics victims have in common? They all did something that Michael didn't like. Whether it's aggression, stolen food, accusations, general teasing, or wishing ill on him, all of these characters suffer from a form of revenge. In the Cult of Thorn arc, that's not how Michael operates. He's driven by a supernatural evil that tells him what to do, and he has one goal, which we'll talk about later. That's part of why the comics are not considered canon, so let's get back to what is canon, the original rampage that would take place on Halloween night in October 1978.
Michael Myers turns 21 years old and so was due back in court to be tried as an adult. Dr. Loomis and nurse Marion Chambers were supposed to transport him to his trial, so Michael took action to make sure that this was not possible. He destroyed his room at Smith's Grove, freed many of his fellow captives, and left behind the word sister in blood. Although to most, this appeared to be a reference to his older sister, Judith, because his younger sister's existence was hidden from the public, and she was given a new name and new family so that she would be protected from any potential harassment. Since Dr. Wynn was the administrator of the sanitarium and also the leader of the Cult of Thorn, it's not hard to imagine that he didn't exactly try his hardest to prevent Michael's escape. Michael waits for Loomis and Chambers to pull up to the sanitarium, and when Loomis gets out to use the nearby phone, he attacks Marion, driving her out of the vehicle, which he takes for himself. I know you can play as Michael Myers in Dead by Daylight, but I think this is proof that he should also be playable in GTA. Let's go bowling. Michael's ability to drive without any training or experience has always been a point of question, one that's even brought up in the movie. Sam Haddonfield is 150 miles away from here. Now, now, for God's sakes, he can't drive a car. He was doing very well last night. When you consider the fact that Michael is no ordinary mental patient, but rather more of a vessel for this ancient evil known as Thorn, this starts to make more sense. Throughout his story, we discover many of the powers granted to him by Thorn, so the ability to operate a car doesn't seem that far-fetched. During his 1978 rampage, Michael is trying to recreate the experience he had when killing his older sister in 1963. I like to think of it as a ritual that he established when he was six, going after his older sister, and now he's trying to recreate it, going after his younger sister. When he was six, he wore a one-piece clown suit and mask, his Halloween costume. So this time, he puts together a similar attire. He runs a mechanic's truck off the road and annihilates him to get the one-piece suit, and when he gets into Haddonfield, he breaks into the general store and steals his now iconic mask in place of the clown mask. He also steals some rope, which he would use later. Next, he breaks into his old home, which now sits abandoned. When they later investigate the house, they find a dead dog, which Loomis has his own explanation for. He got hungry. Okay, he knows his patient best, so I'm willing to accept that explanation. At this point, his sister Lori stops by the house to leave a key under the mat at the request of her adoptive father, who's a realtor who is trying to sell the place. Michael sees her walk up to the front door and leave the key, but he lets her walk away and stares at her as she makes her way towards her school. Did Michael immediately know that this was his sister, or did Lori become a target simply because he was angry that his old house was being sold? We'll get our answer a little bit later, but for now, we just need to know that Michael was planning to make Lori one of his future victims. I also wondered why he stalks Lori throughout the day instead of just killing her right now. He follows her to school and stares her down through the window during her English class, then, after killing some time skulking around the elementary school, keeps surveillance on Lori and her friends as they walk home from school. When Annie yells out at him, he even stops and seems to consider killing them all right then and there, but doesn't. So what's the big hole though? Obviously, the real reason is that the movie would only be 22 minutes long if he killed them in daylight, but also, in 1963, Michael was given his curse as part of the Festival of Samhain. Samhain. And if we go back to the holiday's origins in Celtic Ireland, it was celebrated starting in the evening on October 31st. Subtle, isn't he? So if Michael is waiting for nightfall for the sake of tradition, that may also explain what he does next. He stops by the cemetery and steals his sister's tombstone, with plans to use it as a prop during his recreation of her death. Instead of an immediate sibling slice and dice, he just keeps an eye on Lori, staring from behind some hedges, watching her through her bedroom window, and following her and Annie as they head to their babysitting jobs that evening. When they arrive, he waits for them to park and watches them go to their respective jobs. Remember, if you've seen my Things You Missed episode on the original Halloween, you saw me provide a different interpretation for Michael's behavior that afternoon, because I was analyzing the movie as a standalone story. But in this horror history episode, I'm analyzing Michael's entire character, and the context provided by the sequels in this timeline changes how I have to look at him. It's all about the family connection, because Michael has to sacrifice his entire family before being freed by Thorne. Of course, having a massive amount of retroactive continuity like this can kind of mess up the story if you aren't careful. And let's face it, this isn't Saw. The continuity wasn't the biggest concern. So the next thing that Michael does is go after the sex-crazed teens babysitting across the street from the Doyle house where Lori is babysitting. If I'm gonna try to slap on a reasoning for his actions here, the curse of Thorn is what's telling Michael what to do, and Thorn likes human sacrifice. So any extra victims that Michael can decease along the way are bonus points, even if they aren't a part of Michael's family. It's like how I might go out to get a steak taco, but once I see the menu, I'm probably gonna add the nachos, cinnamon twists, horchata, and probably like three additional steak tacos if we're being real. The way Michael goes after his victims can only be described with one word, unsettling. Everything he does is very methodical, from his slow walking, to his empty staring into space, to his complete silence as he does it all. This creates the impression that he's essentially a blank slate, void of character, almost like a machine programmed by the curse that's been placed on him. This not only fits the idea of the character, essentially being a shape that does these things without interjecting any personality, but also taps into elements that the human mind perceives as unsettling. 
The core reason that people can easily be off-put by the idea of voyeurism goes back to basic survival instinct. When humans lived in the wild, if another lurking animal had eyes on them, it was most likely a predator getting ready to strike. So we're genetically predisposed to be uncomfortable in these situations and avoid them. One of the first studies on the sensation of being watched was called The Feeling of Being Stared At, a title almost as fitting to its content as the title of that 180s movie with the blob, which was called The Blob. The article's author, Dr. Edward Titchener, disproves the idea that someone's gaze itself could be what gives you those goosebumps. That unsettled feeling you get is something that you give yourself. In fact, an actual voyeur isn't even necessary. You can get creeped out just by believing that you're being watched. Michael takes advantage of this by popping in, being seen by the victim de stalking, and then disappearing, leaving his target to wonder if he's still somewhere nearby, zeroing in on them with that piercing stare. Louis, the boogeyman is outside, look! There's nobody outside. But it would not be long before Michael Myers' apparent voyeurism would escalate into much more dangerous behavior. Michael's night continues as he focuses on Lori's friend Annie, who's babysitting at the Wallace house across the street. He starts by locking her in the laundry room, then after she gets out, he eavesdrops as she makes evening plans with her boyfriend. And by evening plans, I mean set. Michael hides inside of her car, she drops off the little girl Lindsay across the street at the Doyle's house, and when she comes back, she hops into the vehicle to go pick up Paul, and he lets her discover that she's not alone before getting down to business. And by business, I mean killing her. He didn't even have the courtesy to phone Paul and let him know that his ride is canceled. He moves Annie's body inside for later use. When he comes back downstairs, he discovers two more horny teens have appeared, Linda and her boyfriend Bob, who are getting at it on the couch. After they move things upstairs, Bob heads down to the kitchen for a drink, and Michael surprises him by doing this. He pins Bob to the wall with a butcher's knife, then further conceals his identity by dressing up as a bedsheet ghost, which, I mean, if he wanted to pretend to be Bob in order to trick Linda, he's already in a costume. He's rocking the mask and jumpsuit. But I guess the bedsheet ghost maybe does a better job of concealing his physique because he's much more physically imposing than Bob. Putting Bob's glasses over the ghost costume is enough to convince Linda that that's her boyfriend. And when she turns her back to him to call Lori, he strangles her with the phone cord. With all three of Lori's friends across the street out of commission, Michael turns out the last remaining lights in the house, much like how the sanitarium went dark before he took out his fellow patient Nancy in 1971. He then arranges the body of Annie in the upstairs bedroom under Judith Meyer's tombstone as a tribute to his first ever attack, and waits for his younger sister to stumble upon it. Linda is stuffed in the closet, and Bob is hung up in the closet with the rope that he stole earlier. Good planning. After discovering this, Lori stumbles out of the room in a mess of emotions, and Michael emerges from the darkness of the room next door, in what is probably the coolest shot in Halloween. She's chased back across the street and tries to defend herself by sticking a knitting needle through his neck, which does cause him to drop to the floor for some time. If you're watching this video, you probably already know that Michael Myers is invincible, and this is a result of the powers he acquires by being cursed by the ancient demon Thorn. But at the same time, he isn't just an unstoppable machine. Hurting him enough will put him down for short periods of time, which I refer to as his recharge periods. When he comes back to, he follows Lori back up the stairs and finds her tending to the kids, but now his focus is on his sister. He finds her hiding in a bedroom closet and busts through. Lights on? No. Lights off. Lori resourcefully pokes out his eye with a coat hanger, which puts him down long enough for her to get out of the room and get the kids out of the house. Michael gets a quick ab workout in, then comes for her once more, and she's only just able to rip off his mask, which completely shocks him for a moment. This is one of the few times that we see his face as an adult, and he looks shocked, almost like the mask is such an important part of this ritual that he can't believe that she's removed it. As he puts it back on, he's shot by someone in the dark and stumbles back into the bedroom. It turns out to be his old psychiatrist, Dr. Loomis, who unloads five more bullets into him, knocking him off the patio and onto the Doyle's front lawn. But as always, Michael's ailment is only temporary, and he flees the scene to recoup. He hides out in a back alley as the police close in on the Doyle house. Now left without a weapon, he goes up to a random residence to restock, and arms himself with a carving knife stolen from Mrs. Elrod's cutting board. Then, just to make sure the knife works, I guess, he breaks into the house of their neighbor, Alice, and successfully tests it out on her. I could try to dissect why the Elrods got to live and Alice didn't, but I think it's better not to. Part of what makes this iteration of Michael scary for audiences is his unpredictability. You don't really know when he's going to strike. This must be when Michael broke into his old elementary school and left this clue that would later be found by police. It's a childlike drawing of a family on Halloween, potentially Michael's family, with a knife stuck into the sister. On the left, there seems to be an already discarded body, which probably represents Judith, meaning that this girl with the knife in her most likely represents Lori. And this answers one of our questions from earlier on in this video. Initially, it was unclear if Michael knew that Lori was his other sister when he first spotted her at the Myers house, and I speculated that maybe he went after her because he was simply upset that she was involved in his childhood home being put on 
the real estate market. So this drawing, if I'm interpreting it correctly, which will surely be up for debate, would prove that he did know about Lori and he was targeting her specifically. He also paints the word Samhain, Samhain onto the chalkboard as a tribute to his demonic lord Thorn, since the curse of Thorn that has afflicted him all of these years is part of the ritual carried out during the festival of Samhain. Samhain. It seems like the lesson on the chalkboard may have already been there when Michael arrived, but it's also possible that it's no coincidence, seeing as how it's an astronomy lesson, and the date of each of Michael's homicidal rampages is determined by the alignment of the planets in the solar system. At this point, news of a killer in Haddonfield is spreading all over the media, which at the time meant TVs and radios, and Michael overhears where Lori is being taken from this cowboy's boombox. Yeehaw, roll it. There is one survivor. 17-year-old Lori Strode was found directly across the street from the home where the murders took place. The teenager was taken across town to Haddonfield Memorial Clinic. He must have been getting close to Michael's bedtime or something, because after hearing this, he just lets the next 17 teenagers he crosses paths with go free. Seriously, I counted. He just goes straight to the hospital and dumps out the rest of his cherry slurpee in the dumpster. He promptly heads downstairs to hide in the nursery before continuing on to the storeroom where he's able to slash through the phone line effectively isolating Lori and the hospital staff from calling in outside help. One by one, he takes out each of the staff members at the hospital taking care of Lori, starting with the security guard, Mr. Garrett, who gets tomahawked with the pointy end of a hammer, and then an EMT named Bud gets choked from behind after making love to his girlfriend, Karen, in a hydrotherapy bath. After doing so, he cranks up the heat of the bath to over 130 degrees Fahrenheit in preparation of his next kill. <laughs> Remember how Michael used a ghost costume pretending to be Bob in order to get close to Linda earlier that evening? Now, Michael pretends to be Bud while Karen's back is turned, and when he gets close enough, he dunks her repeatedly in the back. In my opinion, this takes the cake in terms of brutality. Brutality! They say that burning and drowning are the two most painful ways to die, and this is a combination of both. In fact, if you look at the top tens, which is a website that lets the internet vote on ranking things, people have agreed that burning to death and drowning would be the two worst ways to go. Of course, we'll never know for sure, seeing as how everyone who participated in this poll was still alive, but you get the idea. On top of that, I can only imagine the stark terror that Karen felt, because she thought she was in the safe, protective hands of her boyfriend, and she turns around to realize that it's actually this terrifying masked man. She's also undressed, so add a feeling of vulnerability to the equation, and this is just not your ideal way to spend your final moments. It seems like Michael just wants to clear out anyone who could pose as an obstacle to him getting to Lori. And the next person in his way was most likely nurse Virginia Alves. Michael catches her in one of the surgery rooms and ties her down to an operating table, then hooks her up to a severed IV catheter so she's unable to move as her blood slowly drains out of her body. He continues to the office of Dr. Frederick Mixter and prescribes him with 20 cc's of medication injected directly in his right eye. Then, when Nurse Janet Marshall comes to check on him, Michael appears out of the dark and jabs the blood vessel in her temple with an air-filled syringe, which essentially creates an air bubble in your bloodstream and stops the flow of blood to the brain, which is usually lethal. It seems his very straightforward and methodical way of going about things doesn't hold him back from getting creative with some of his kills. With all of the staff that regularly walk the corridors of the main lobby either dead or trying to find help, Michael has free reign to slow walk his way right into Lori's room uncontested. Now armed with a surgical scalpel, he sees his target apparently unconscious due to the medication that she's on and decides to get stabby. When he realizes she's not there, he looks to the security monitors to find her and heads in her direction. But first, he comes across a conversation between the last two remaining hospital employees, a nurse named Jill Franco and an ambulance attendant named Jimmy. He overhears Jimmy instruct her to drive to the sheriff's station for help if she doesn't find anyone in the east wing. So while she's searching the other side of the building, Michael goes out to the parking lot and disables all of the vehicles by stabbing their tires and cutting their fuel lines. As Jill comes back in, Michael hears her calling out Lori's name and goes towards the sound. Just before she realizes he's there, he drives the scalpel into her back so hard that he's able to lift her off of the ground, with a small blade holding up her entire weight. This is where another one of the abilities that the curse has granted him starts to become clear. In addition to being immortal, he's also acquired superhuman strength. With one more staff member out of the way and his main target finally in his line of sight again, he goes after her, but his refusal to walk anywhere near a normal pace doesn't do him any favors, and Lori gets away in an elevator. However, it's not long before Michael catches her outside. How about that? He's almost able to reach her before someone lets her back into the building. Michael just crashes through the door like a deer in a hair salon. 
and sees Dr. Loomis and Nurse Chambers trying to protect Lori. His old psychiatrist is armed and ready, and shoots him five more times, bringing the grand total to 11 on the night. As we've seen to be the case, whenever Michael is attacked, he collapses temporarily, but cannot die. The state marshal that came with Dr. Loomis goes in for a closer look, stupidly assuming that Michael had stopped breathing, and Michael springs to life and slits his throat. Loomis and Lori retreats to another operating room, so Michael busts down that door too, bringing him within striking distance of his doctor. Loomis's gun jams, and Michael takes the opportunity to stab him in the gut. When he corners Lori, she fires a couple shots at him, which apparently lands just above his eyes, I guess, judging by the fact that the mask doesn't have any bullet holes. The drip down from his wounds temporarily blinds him, and rather than just using his hearing to try to locate her, he just kind of flails around the room in the general direction direction where he thinks that she might be for some reason. Lori is audibly whimpering too, so it should have been kind of easy. Not one of Michael's finer moments. Somehow though, he is able to hear the hissing sound of the gas tanks opened by Loomis near the front of the room, but before long, the sound surrounds him. The last thing he hears is the voice of his psychiatrist. It is time, Michael. What the fuck? This is easily the biggest blast that Mr. Myers has yet to endure. With the mechanics of his invincibility and recharge period still mostly a mystery, I can only assume that it was his sheer willpower and determination that kept him going, because he knew he was so close to finishing his sister off. He was able to force himself to go a little bit longer before collapsing again, as he had when suffering would-be fatal blows in the past. So to Lori's absolute horror, Michael actually walks out of the blaze, literally covered in burning flames before finally, his body can take him no further and he falls face forward where he would continue to burn until the fire department arrived and found him in a coma, this time a much more permanent one as he would spend the next 10 years in this comatose state. This time, instead of being taken back to Smith's Grove, Michael was locked up in a higher security facility known as Ridgemont Federal Sanitarium, where despite being a vegetable for his entire stay, he gained a reputation for being the devil himself, and even the guards were afraid of him. As for the room that he's locked in, Welcome to hell. After 10 years of being in a coma, it doesn't look like Michael is ever going to come out of it, and it was decided that he should be moved back to Smith's Grove to open up space for other, more threatening patients. Dr. Loomis is still Michael's doctor during this time, though it's said that the position is more ceremonial. Many of the day-to-day -day decisions fall on the Ridgemont Medical Administrator, Dr. Hoffman. Michael was to be transferred on October 30th, 1988, one day shy of the 10-year anniversary of his rampage. Extra precautions are taken to ensure a smooth operation. However, disaster strikes when the ride to Smith's Grove doesn't quite go as planned. During Michael Myers' original stay at Smith's Grove Sanitarium, he was assumed to be relatively harmless as more and more time passed. He was relatively catatonic, and only Dr. Loomis was able to see through him and understand that the patient was still dangerous. It seems that Michael employed a similar tactic at Ridgemont, because while it's assumed that he's still comatose during his patient transfer, he is secretly awake and conscious to hear the transfer personnel discussing his living relatives. Did Hoffman say anything about living relatives? Yeah, a niece living in his hometown. Clearly, Michael is sentient during this ambulance ride. It would be hard to say for sure how long he's been awake before this, but given how he tricked most of the sanitarium staff as a kid, I wouldn't be surprised if he was faking his coma for the last couple years now. The information about who his living relative is is also important because of the curse of Thorn. Even if Lori wasn't around anymore, he still has to take out the rest of his family in order to spare the community at large. Once he hears what he needs to hear, Myers breaks free and demonstrates his unbelievable strength by shoving his thumb through the man's forehead into his skull. They make it just south of Mill Creek, about four hours outside of Haddonfield, before the ambulance crashes, probably the result of Michael attacking the driver. It ends up flipped over in a river, talk about rolling the ambo, but that wasn't even the end of the suffering for at least one of the passengers. We can actually see carnage smeared all over the outside of the vehicle, which would suggest that one of the transfer personnel actually survived and may have tried to escape the crash site, only to be reeled back in and gutted by Michael Myers. Since his signature mask and jumpsuit burned up in the fire in 1978, Michael feels the need to get back in costume and stops at the local auto shop called Penny's Garage. Here he finds a stake and uses it to impale the mechanic and take his jumpsuit. He ends up hanging the guy up in chains in the back of his tow truck. It seems that Michael likes to make a spectacle of his victims, whether that be the Shrine of Babysitters in 1978, the unique cause of death for each of the hospital staff, the capsized ambulance, or now the strung up mechanic. This, like many of his actions, may go back to Thorne. Perhaps Michael wants to show off his work to gain favor with the ancient being. Or maybe he just does this to intimidate the survivors as much as possible, because he enjoys it. He goes to a small diner attached to the garage and relieves the waitress of her duties. By the looks of it, this one died of strangulation. If you don't like the service, you don't have to leave a tip, but damn. He also destroys all of the telephones, a tactic that worked well to buy him some time before the authorities showed up at the hospital in 1978, so why not try it again here? It would seem that he's looking for his next victim inside the kitchen when he's confronted by his old friend, Dr. Loomis. His doctor tries to slow him down with another round of lead, but this time he gets out of the way 
and tries to strand Loomis at the garage by stealing a tow truck and using it to sideswipe the gas pump to blow up Loomis's car. Now that he's got a suit and vehicle, the next item on his list is getting a mask, and he's able to find one at Vincent Drug in Haddonfield. Actually, the one he gets looks like a cheap knockoff of the one he had, which makes sense, because his actions 10 years ago made the mask more popular, so they probably had to be mass-produced at lower quality. He also has a chance encounter with his niece, Jamie Lloyd, the living relative that he heard about earlier. But like he did with Lori in the past, he waits until nightfall to come after her. He stalks the house that evening, and after Jamie and her adoptive sister Rachel head out for trick-or-treating, he does a little investigating and confirms Jamie's relationship to Lori Strode. He also gets his stabbing hand warmed up on Rachel and Jamie's dog because he's an asshole. We know in previous situations that Michael has thrived in the darkness, like the blackout at the sanitarium and his turning off the lights in the Wallace house. This time he goes straight to the source, the power station in Haddonfield, and throws a technician into a transformer, not only electrocuting him but also causing a blackout in town. He then completely massacres the police station and leaves the place in ruins and without a police force, save for a couple of stragglers. On a foggy back road, he finds Rachel, who is supposed to be babysitting Jamie that night, and scares her away. At least, I assume that's him. It's hard to say for sure with all these imitators running around. Rachel is soon picked up by the police with Jamie in tow, and again, I assume Michael is the one who sticks around to see where they head. However, the car disappears out of his sight, so he breaks into a different police car, which is stationed at Jamie's house, and hides in the backseat in order to catch a free ride to wherever they're going. Although the house is supposedly locked down, Michael still finds a way in somehow, and eyes his next target, Deputy Logan, who's in charge of guarding the front door. Once Loomis and Sheriff Meeker leave the house, he makes his move, literally tearing his head and hand from his body. Michael takes a page from his murder of Bob Sims and Linda Vanderklok the decade before by pretending to be someone else. He sits in Logan's rocking chair until the sheriff's daughter, Kelly Meeker, comes along and in another similarity to the Bob Sims kill, he impales her body against a door, this time using Deputy Logan's rifle to do so. That leaves two more human obstacles in the house for Michael to get through before reaching Jamie. Rachel and her love interest, Brady. Michael finds them on the stairs, and Brady tries to fight him physically, but is easily no match. Michael lifts him up and crushes his neck and skull with his bare hands. He conveniently finds another carving knife in the loft, and comes after Rachel and Jamie with it onto the roof of the house, where he narrowly misses turning the elder of the two into a rooftop Halloween decoration. He eventually knocks her down onto the lawn, where she falls unconscious, but Jamie is able to escape. However, Michael hears the security alarm going off at the elementary school, and decides to search there for her. Suddenly having blonde hair for some reason, he ambushes Dr. Loomis and throws him out of the way, and he goes flying through the door like a Doberman through a coffee table. Oh. Michael, after quickly popping into the bathroom to dye his hair back to normal, appears on the stairs behind Jamie. And he's actually able to grab her after she falls down the steps, and is unable to get back on her feet. However, Rachel saves her when she shows up to blind Michael with the fire extinguisher sprayed in his face. If Malcolm in the Middle is to be believed, this could actually work. However, as per usual with Michael Myers, his blindness is only temporary, and he's actually able to sneak past everybody and latch himself onto the bottom of the truck that comes to rescue Rachel and Jamie. He clings to it as he beelines out of Haddonfield. Anyone who's ever had to do the arm hang in gym class knows how much strength this requires. I think I could handle it, though. He climbs up while the car is in motion and defeats all three of the Illinois boys riding in the back before punching through the window to tear the face off the driver. Rachel takes the wheel and tries to buck him off with some sharp turns, but when that doesn't work, she resorts to slamming the brakes. Vocabulary time, I'm gonna call that a brake eat. <laughs> Michael gets up, looking ready to line up and block for the Chicago Bears offense, so Rachel just channels her inner linebacker and tries to run him over. And since this would be a fatal blow for any normal human, it knocks him unconscious for a period of time. A confused Jamie wanders into the roadside ditch that Michael is lying in and grabs his hand. It's my understanding that this action causes a mental connection between the two, that he was transferring part of his curse on to her. After being rammed into a roadside ditch with the full force of a pickup truck, the life comes into Michael Myers just a moment too late to attack Jamie, and instead, the police and the remaining Illinois boys all open fire on him. With seven men all firing shots, Michael is knocked back into a hole. Michael Myers is not usually one to back away from a fight, but I think this time he realizes he's overmatched, and not wanting to end up back in a high-security mental hospital, he crawls away and finds an opening to wiggle through just before the police drop a stick of dynamite into the hole to try to finish him off. He ends up floating down a stream to quickly get away, and ends up at a homeless camp, and when its scruffy inhabitant comes out to investigate the disturbance, this happens. I'm guessing Michael just runs out of energy. 
I think it's been well established at this point that whenever Michael survives death, he needs some time to regenerate his power, to recharge himself. We saw him take a quick rest after being struck by the pickup truck, but he never recharges after being shot up by the gunman, because he needs to use a little bit more of his energy to get out of there before the dynamite goes off and just puts him in another coma. It's just like at the hospital 10 years ago. After the explosion, he's able to go on a little bit longer if he really puts in some extra effort. So Michael was essentially just delaying the inevitable, and he runs out of power once he gets some distance from the police. It's not clear what happens directly after that, but Michael would continue to hide out there for an entire year, once again using the days surrounding Halloween as the time frame for his violent ritual. It was October 30th, 1989, when he finally took the knife to his off-the-grid cohabitant. Not the nicest way to treat a guy who gave you a free place to live for a year, but I guess at this point you've probably realized that Michael is not the nicest guy. The next day, he hides outside of the Carruthers' house, then breaks in the back and spies on Rachel as she gets herself ready to go out. After f***ing around in the house for a while, he decides that he's waited long enough and gets her with a pair of scissors through the chest. Rachel, like many of the victims that Michael took out this Halloween, is deposited into a shrine that he's building in the attic of the Myers' house. I already talked about how Michael loves his shrines. Later, Rachel's friends Tina and Sammy come over to look for her, so Michael decides to stalk them for a little while. Michael's just trying to relive the good old days. Back then, it was teenage babysitters. Now, it's teenage house sitters. He'll take what he can get. The next victim, of that year's Halloween is Tina's boyfriend Mikey. Mike Goal gets a rise out of him by leaving a scratch on his car. When Mikey tries to start a fight over it, he stops him in his tracks by grabbing his throat and whacks him with what looks like a gardening fork. Keeping up with the tradition of pretending to be someone else, he steals Mikey's car and wears the mask that Tina got him. She gets into the car, thinking that she's being picked up by her boyfriend to go to the Halloween party. I just love barbaric men. You'll love this guy, Tina. I also love how when Tina tries to kiss him, he just takes it and then looks at her. It's even weirder when you think about the fact that that's his first kiss. She asks if they can stop for a pack of cigarettes, so he stops at a gas station, and while she's inside, he switches back into his usual William Shatner slash Greg Nicotero looking mask, a sign that he was probably about to give her the old Michael Myers special. I'm really running out of advertiser-friendly ways to say that Michael Myers killed someone, okay? However, before she gets back in the car, the police raid the gas station and pick her up. They'd been tipped off that she was in danger thanks in part to Jamie's psychic vision, and Michael, the real Michael Myers that is, flees the area. We see this iteration of Michael Myers start to shy away from crowds of armed police officers, because he knows what can happen if he gets shot too many times. He'll have to do his recharge thing, and that gives authorities an opportunity to potentially pick him up, and he wants to avoid going back to Smith's Grove or any other facility at all costs. Later that night, he shows up at the Tower Farm, which is home to the biggest teen Halloween party in Haddonfield. He sees Tina, Sammy, and Sammy's boyfriend Spitz leave the party and go into the barn next door. Michael equips himself with a pitchfork and uh, pitches Spitz out of the way before grabbing a scythe and harvesting Sammy's neck. When he comes out of the barn, his local infamy actually works to his advantage because the cops assume that he's just a kid that they saw earlier who was dressed up as Michael Myers. I can understand why a lot of kids dressed up as him in 1988 during Halloween 4 because it had been 10 years since the babysitter massacre at that point, but dressing up as Michael in 1989 in Haddonfield when 17 people lost their lives to him the prior fall, and he's still a wanted criminal on the loose and most certainly somewhere in town because it's Halloween, maybe that's just not the smartest move. But anyway, with their guard down, he's easily able to take out the cops with the pitchfork. He gets back in the car, maybe planning to go find Jamie, when Jamie just shows up on the scene with her little friend Billy. This boogeyman business is getting way too easy. The victims are supposed to run away from him, not the other way around. He starts by chasing down Tina by intentionally driving slowly after her. Jimmy and I talked about this in the Halloween 5 Things You Missed. Everyone knows that Michael Myers walks slow. We're never given a concrete reason for this, but I've always assumed that it ties into his curse. I talked about how he spent his first 15 years in Smith's Grove in near Catatonia. He became known for being this creepy, unmoving shape. So he kept that aspect of his persona intact by chasing his victims at a very slow and steady rate, relying more on power than speed. It doesn't often end up being a detriment to him because his victims are usually distracted, fear-stricken, or stupidly brave. So it's not often that somebody gets away. But seeing Michael go slowly after someone in a car doesn't make a whole lot of sense, since we've seen in previous scenes that he is capable of driving fast. The only explanation that makes sense here is that Michael is savoring his kill. He's intentionally stretching it out because he enjoys being the predator, and maybe enjoys seeing the fear on his victims' faces and in their body language. <laughs> Maybe this is also why Michael intentionally misses Lori with a knife so many times on that night in 78. Who knows? Before reaching Tina, he changes course and comes after Jamie and Billy. Reasoning for this? I think maybe he didn't see them right away. I mean, it's pretty hard to do a character analysis video on someone who has so little character, but that's also part of what makes him great. Jamie zigzags her way into the woods, which results in Michael crashing the car into a tree, and somehow it explodes. Tina's boyfriend would be pissed if he were still alive. Michael continues to pursue Jamie on foot, and due to her injured leg, it looks like he might get her until Tina sacrifices herself to give Jamie more time. 
Michael uses the knife for this one. A true classic never goes out of style. Wait, wrong franchise. That's when the rest of the police force shows up to rescue Jamie and Billy, and after they're safely escorted away, Loomis meets Michael at the edge of the forest with a message. He tells Michael that the rage that drives him will not go away if he kills everyone. The only way he can get rid of it is to face it where it first began, his childhood home on Lampkin Lane. This is the first time we've ever seen an internal struggle inside of Michael. For the last 26 years of his life, he's been consumed by this curse of Thorn. All of his actions have been motivated by it. For the first time since then, we would see the real Michael Myers creeping to the surface. Before heading home to the Myers house, Michael first makes an appearance at the Haddonfield Children's Clinic. This is where Jamie and Billy live. This accomplishes a few things. One, Michael is able to determine that Jamie isn't there, as promised by Loomis, who is with her at the Myers house. Two, it draws the police in that direction, making it easier for Michael to get back into his old home. And three, he attacks one of the officers guarding the clinic and steals his squad car, which he uses to drive himself to Lampkin Lane and rear-end the only cop still defending the perimeter shortly before smashing his face onto the dashboard. He makes his way inside, and Loomis meets him downstairs and tries to convince him to put down the knife, telling him that Jamie is the key to putting an end to the rage inside of him. Michael actually hesitates and lowers the knife at first, and for a moment, it looks as if his psychiatrist is finally getting through to him. This shows that the human side of Michael Myers is still down there somewhere, and although we don't see it often, he does want to escape the malediction that's been inflicted upon him. It seems that the rage wins over in the end, though, because he comes to his senses and slashes Dr. Loomis across the torso, then tosses him down the stairs. Michael goes after Jamie, but she scurries away, so he gets his fix by tying a rope around this cop's neck and tossing him out the window. Michael chases Jamie downstairs, then down to the basement, then upstairs, then up to the attic. Jamie discovers what happened to Rachel and her dog Max, and in a last ditch effort, lies down in the coffin that Michael has set up for her and attempts to have a heart to heart with her uncle. Surprisingly, Jamie is actually able to get through to the human side of Michael Myers in a way that Dr. Loomis was never able to. She asks him to take off his mask, and when he does, Jamie sees a tear running down his face. She even comments on his humanity. You're just like me. I'm an asshole just like you. However, Michael's moment of humanity peeking through is short-lived, when Jamie tries to wipe away his tears and the rage takes back over. She runs downstairs, and when Michael comes down to find her, he finds… Dr. Loomis offering her to him? This must have been a surprising turn of events. It would be like if Susan just showed up at my door and handed me the Gold Creator Award. Of course, it turns out to be a trap. Which, if Susan shows up at my door, I'm definitely gonna assume it's a trap. Shut that door! A large net of heavy metal chains falls from above, considerably slowing down his movement as he loads Michael up with tranquilizer darts, then just goes to town with a plank. Yeah. Michael wakes up in jail, but this time his stay in captivity wouldn't last long, as Dr. Wynn decided to take matters into his own hands to make sure that his protege lives up to expectations. Wynn single-handedly raids the police station. He makes quick work of the seven officers stationed there and blows the door off Michael's cell, where the two can make a quick getaway. Despite being free again, it would be a number of years before the planets aligned properly for Michael to make his next Samhain Sam sacrifice. Now, if you're riding along with us here on the Halloween Express, we've just finished Halloween 5 and we're moving on to The Curse of Michael Myers. There are two versions of this movie, the theatrical cut and the producer's cut, which was publicly released later. They're basically the same movie. The biggest difference is the endings, which is why you'll ride all the way into the station with us no matter which one you choose, and your decision will really only dictate which platform you exit to. The theatrical cut is technically canon, so that's the direction I'll be heading in, but if you want to see me talk about the producer's cut, check out the Things You Missed episode. It's been six years since Michael escaped the jail cell, leading many to speculate if he's dead or alive. It is October 30th, 1995, and Jamie Lloyd is pregnant with her first child. She's kidnapped by the Cult of Thorn shortly before the delivery, so they can either pass the curse on to the baby or let Michael kill both of them. But a nice nurse helps her escape with her firstborn. After six years of waiting in the shadows, Michael is dispatched to stop them. He pins the helpful nurse up on a wall, completing his trilogy of wall art victims, and snaps the neck of a random guy who gets in between him and Jamie, but she manages to get away in a vehicle. Michael uses a Smith's Grove van to hunt her and runs her off the road into a pumpkin patch. She attempts to hide inside of the adjacent barn, but having just delivered a baby that day, there's not much energy or fight 
left in her. And after seven years of waiting, Michael finally brings his niece's life to an end by picking her up and skewering her on this piece of farming equipment. It seems like she's already done for at this point, but just to make sure, he proceeds to turn on said farming equipment. For the first time in 32 years, he actually managed to make some progress on his main goal, which is sacrificing his family members. Unfortunately for him, he cannot be freed from his curse just yet, because now he has Jamie's baby to track down. She is the last of his bloodline. No, Dr. Loomis. She's not the last. The next day is Halloween, October 31st, 1995. Just as he always does when he returns to Haddonfield, Michael visits his childhood home, but this time he finds another family living there. This is the Strode family, the relatives of the couple that adopted Lori all of those years ago. Naturally, Michael is not any more a fan of someone living in his old room than he was 17 years ago, so he deals with these negative emotions in the same way he deals with everything in life, by killing them. The mother, Deborah Strode, gets cut down with an axe, but Michael, in maybe the nicest thing he's ever done for anyone, is courteous enough to put her stuff in the wash. It looks like she had spilled some cherry slurpee on it. The father, John Strode, is thrown into a breaker box and electrocuted. Like Mikey's car six years before, he inexplicably explodes. John and Deborah's son, Tim, and his girlfriend, Beth, are at the live airing of the Haddonfield Halloween radio special. Michael goes there and ambushes the host inside of his van. The body would later fall out of a tree, terrifying the spectators. Later still, he returns home, where Tim and Beth are already getting hot and heavy. Tim jumps in the shower afterwards and asks Beth to bring him a towel, but Michael brings him one instead. Tim doesn't notice the thorn symbol on his wrist, though, so Michael gives him the old throat slash when he gets out and proceeds to stab Beth in the back. In the theatrical cut, the edit is very YouTube poopish. That just leaves John and Deborah's daughter Kara Strode and her son Danny as the last two inhabitants of the house. Kara manages to hide in a dark corner and knock Michael down the stairs, making her the first one to knock Michael out with her bare hands. He comes back and grabs her ankle as she's trying to get Danny to safety though, and she's only able to escape by whacking him with a fire poker. He chases them back across the street to the boarding house, but Dr. Wynn and the other cult members are waiting for them there. So Michael is instructed to return to his home away from home, the Smith's Grove Sanitarium. That brings us to the last morning of the original Halloween timeline, November 1st, 1995. November 1st is one of the worst days of the year as it is, because it's the furthest day from Halloween on the calendar. I can only imagine that having an immortal serial killer after you on that day doesn't make it any easier to swallow. Jamie's baby, who's been named Steven Strode, and Kara's son Danny Strode are captured. We have to do a little bit of guesswork to figure out what the cult's overall plan here is, but I think the plan is to kill the baby, which would effectively lift the Curse of Thorn from Michael and give them the opportunity to place it on Danny. That would explain why he's been hearing the voices in his head, just like the six-year-old Michael did the evening before he was possessed to kill Judith. Michael's quiet yet destructive demeanor has surprised many of his 60 plus victims over the years. But what he does next is a different kind of surprise. Michael turns against the cult of Thorn. Ah! He walks amongst us, brother. He's come back and he's very angry. Tommy and Kara have one close encounter with him, and then he just walks into the lab and starts cutting down doctors, nurses, and surgeons left and right. If you work in medicine in Haddonfield, just take the day off on Halloween, seriously. We're left yet again to wonder why Michael's behavior changes so suddenly. I've seen it suggested that he was just tired of obeying the cult. I think that makes no sense. Why would he turn on them when he was potentially so close to breaking the curse after 32 years? I see it as more of a caged bear situation. While Michael is possessed by Thorn, he's essentially like a wild animal. Anyone who gets too close is in danger of being killed by him. That's just his nature, what he does. He doesn't have any real allegiances, but he does still have the goal of killing off his next of kin. I'm not saying that he's incapable of thinking for himself. I mean, we see him sneak up on people and make reactionary decisions throughout the series. I'm just saying that if he has the chance to kill, he's probably going to. During this massacre, one of the medics escapes out into the hall, and that's when he sees Tommy and Kara trying to flee with the two young kids. This is the first time in a while that Michael is really close to completing his main task, that is wiping out his bloodline, so we see him actually walking faster than he's ever walked before. Tommy closes up this gate in order to create a barrier between them and Michael, which totally screws over this medic for no reason. Michael 
bashes the guy's face into the bars and then just knocks down the gate anyways. Having spent 15 years there, this is kind of like Michael's home turf, so he's able to take some kind of shortcut to cut them off. They duck into a random lab filled with human embryos or babies growing in tanks. Some think that this means Jamie was artificially inseminated to have Steven. Others believe that this was a setup for a seventh Halloween film that never happened. I don't think either of those makes that much sense because these embryos are clearly growing into babies outside of the body. I mean, this isn't a typical IVF lab. And this lab scene was actually added for the theatrical cut after the death of Donald Pleasance, who plays Loomis. It would have been an excellent opportunity to tie up any loose threads, not cast new ones. Feel free to share your own interpretations though. Michael punches through the door to get access to the lab, and Tommy seems to concede to him and offers up the baby, but of course it's just an empty bundle of blankets. Tommy stabs four syringes into him, and then Kara hits him with a pipe over and over. He pins her to a lab table and chokes her, but he lets her go after Danny yells out and gives away his position. Leave her alone! Michael realizes that Danny has the baby and attempts to seize him, but Tommy drugs him one last time, giving Kara and the kids a chance to make a run for it. Then Tommy beats him up with a pipe, Dr. Loomis style. Yeah, he's a little too proud of himself there. And believe it or not, that is the last we ever see of the original iteration of Michael Myers. The theatrical cut ends with a suggestion of some kind of confrontation between Michael and Loomis, where Loomis managed to get his mask off, but judging by this sound, I am led to believe that Michael ultimately got the upper hand. The original continuity ended with a whimper in terms of box office revenue. Four, five, and six represent three of the four lowest grossing Halloween movies as of 2021. I don't really care about that, but from a horror perspective, it makes sense why the series was falling out of favor. The Cult of Thorn storyline gives an explanation to Michael Myers' creepy and unpredictable behavior, and in a way, that demystifies the character. For years I've been convinced there must be some reason, some method behind Michael's madness. But at the same time, as we've seen in this video, there is still a lot to speculate about. I think back to the sheer look of confusion when Laurie removes Michael's mask in 1978. Michael operates at his highest potential when he, the mysteries of his character, and his true intentions are properly masked. Click that playlist on the left for my entire catalog of Halloween franchise horror history episodes. If you love horror and all things Halloween, remember to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week. Ring the death bell and select all notifications, and I will see you in the next one. Assuming the planets align.